بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا وعظيمنا وحبيب قلوبنا وشفيع نفوسنا أبي القاسم محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين وأصحابه الغر الميامين الحمد لله الذي جعلنا من المتمسكين بولاية سيدي ومولاي علي بن أبي طالب اللهم صل على الحمد لله الذي هدانا لهذا وما كنا لنهتدي لولا أن هدانا الله أما بعد يقول الله في كتابه الكريم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم لقد نصركم الله في مواطن كثيرة ويوم حنين إذا أعجبتكم كثرتكم فلم تغن عنكم شيئا وضاقت عليكم الأرض بما رحبت ثم وليتم مدبرين The first of our salawat in honor of Rasulullah Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. A second louder salawat in honor of Amir al-Mu'mineen Ali ibn Abi Talib. The third with your loudest voices in honor of the Imam of our time, Imam Sahib al-Asr wa al-Zaman. Respected brothers and sisters, salamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. The Battle of Hunayn is without a doubt one of the most famous battles in Islamic history. And a battle that requires a thorough analysis. For it is a battle from which many important historical lessons may be learned and many fundamental theological principles may be observed. Unfortunately, the Battle of Hunayn has not been dissected with the depth that it deserves. In many of our communities, the Battle of Hunayn is very much an understudied battle. And indeed, it is one of the greatest victories from the battles of the Holy Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. As we know, the first battle that the Holy Prophet led was the Battle of Badr. And the final battle that the Holy Prophet led was the Battle of Hunayn. Ironically, these two battles are the only two battles which are mentioned by name in the Holy Quran. As in battles such as Uhud or Khandaq or Khaybar are not mentioned by name in the Quran. Yes, there may be a reference to Khandaq with, for example, the Ahzab. Or, for example, there may be a reference to Uhud in the idea of what happened on the day of Uhud. But the word Uhud is not in the Quran, and the word Khandaq is not in the Quran, and the word Khaybar is not in the Quran. Whereas the battles of Badr and the battles of Hunayn are the only two battles of the Holy Prophet mentioned in the Quran. The battle of Badr, as you all know, is mentioned in Surah 3, verse 123, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala states, وَلَقَدْ نَصَرَكُمَ اللَّهُ بِبَدْرٍ وَأَنْتُمْ أَذِلَّةٍ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave you victory at Badr when you were a small number. As you know, there was only 313 of them against 950 of the opposition. Yet with Ali ibn Abi Talib in the middle, they absolutely annihilated the opposition. The other battle to be mentioned in the Quran is Hunayn in the verse that I've just quoted where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala states, لَقَدْ نَصَرَكُمَ اللَّهُ فِي مَوَاطِنَ كَثِيرَةٍ وَيَوْمَ حُنَيْنٍ Allah gave you victory in many places and on the day of Hunayn. إِذَا عَجَبَتْكُمْ كَثْرَتُكُمْ فَلَمْ تُغْنِ عَنْكُمْ شَيْئًا Your numbers made you proud on that day, but your numbers never helped you on that day. وَضَاقَتْ عَلَيْكُمُ الْعَرْضُ بِمَا رَحُبَتْ ثُمَّ وَلَّيْتُمْ مُدْبَرِينَ the earth, which is normally so spacious for you, seems so small. And a number of you ran away on that day. When you look at the way Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about Hunayn, 
It comes as a surprise that we mention Khaybar and Khandaq more than Hunayn. As in, if you go to many a poetry event or you go to many an event of celebration, you'll hear about Rasulullah's great victory at Khandaq. You'll hear about his victory at Khaybar. But hardly ever do you hear anyone mentioning Hunayn. And that's a tragedy because when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala devotes a verse to Hunayn and not just a verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in Hunayn that I gave the Prophet Muhammad many a victory and on the day of Hunayn there was a pride with their numbers and their numbers didn't help them because when you are proud of your number the earth becomes small for you and many of you run away many people turn around and say hold on a minute what happened in this battle as in if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't mention Khaybar and Khandaq even though those were great battles specifically by name yet he mentions Hunayn what is it that's so special about the day of Hunayn? When we come to study a battle in the religion of Islam, someone may turn around and say, what's the need to discuss these battles? As in we're in the year 2013. Why do I need to study these battles? Firstly, I study these battles to build my relationship with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. I want to build my relationship with his seerah. I want to know how did he lead an army? Which decisions did he make? In which areas did he consult his companions? In which areas did Allah guide him? Do you know how many Muslims in the world today hardly know anything about the life of their Prophet? Do you know how many Muslims in the world today if you were to ask them about his life in Medina are unable to tell you about his life in Medina? Even though in the Quran the verse says قُلْ إِن كُنْتُمْ تُحِبُّونَ اللَّهِ فَاتَّبِعُونِ Say, if you love Allah, then follow me. Allah will love you. How do I expect to follow Rasulullah when I haven't studied the battles of Rasulullah? It's in a battle when the greatness of a leader emerges. Because under pressure, under duress, in the most difficult circumstances, that's when you see the quality of a leader. That's when you see the prowess of a leader amongst his soldiers. Therefore, on the first level, when we study Hunayn, it's for us to understand, firstly, build a relationship with our Prophet in this month of Muharram. As in Muharram is not just a time of mourning, it's a time where it's a New Year resolution for me to ask myself, what do I know about Rasulullah? What have I studied about Rasulullah? How much have I honored Rasulullah and the greatness of Rasulullah? Secondly, Hunayn is arguably Ali ibn Abi Talib's finest moment on the battlefield. Some will turn around and say, hold on, all my life I heard Khaybar was his finest or I heard Khandaq was his finest. That's when you haven't heard real history. Because when a person's heard real history, then there's only one battle where Ali ibn Abi Talib shone above any of his opposition. And for me to make that statement is a huge statement. Because you're talking of a man who's seen Jamal and Safin and Nahrawan and Uhud and Khandaq and Khaybar and Badr. Wallah, they are only a touch of what he did for Islam on the day of Hunayn. If a person realizes what Amir al muminin done at the age of 30 on the day of Hunayn, then they'll realize the sacrifices the man gave for the religion of Islam were not small. Thirdly, the reason we study the battle of Hunayn is because it is the most mentioned battle by the Imams of Ahlul Bayt in their lives. If you were to study the lives of Imam Amir al muminin Imam al Hassan, Imam al Hussein, all the way until the 11th Imam, you'll find always they'll refer back to Hunayn and the greatness of the day of Hunayn. Therefore, it's not just Allah who says, No, the Imams of Ahlul Bayt in their greatest sermons also discuss this battle. Therefore, tonight, let me examine the battle of Hunayn in depth. In order that we understand the significance of this great battle, and I'd like to examine this in the following stages. Number one, what was the prelude to the battle of Hunayn? And what happened with the tribes who didn't want to submit to Rasulullah when he conquered Mecca? Number two, when Rasulullah left Mecca to fight in Hunayn, did he appoint a leader to look after Mecca or did he leave it for the people to choose? 
Number three, who were the ferocious warriors of Thaqif and Hawazin who wanted to annihilate the Muslims on that day? And who in particular did they point towards? Number four, what was the skirmish that occurred after the victory at Hunayn about the booty and the spoils of war? And how was Rasulullah disrespected by those around him? Number five, how did Imam Al-Hadi answer Al-Mutawakkil over the issue of this particular ayah? And number six, how did Imam Zain Al-Abideen destroy Yazid through mentioning Hunayn in Sham? Let's examine this and dissect this topic in complete depth. When you look at the prelude to the Battle of Hunayn, the prelude was an interesting prelude. The Battle of Hunayn took place a couple of years before Rasulullah died. Rasulullah had conquered Medina as we know already. And now he also conquered Mecca. For many years, the companions had resided in Medina, but Mecca was always difficult for them to go back to. If they were allowed to go back to Mecca, they'd go back for a few days only, maybe perform the Umrah, but they'd have to return back to Medina. Rasulullah conquered Medina with an outright victory. He took with him over 10,000 of his companions. For many years, Abu Sufyan had been at the helm in Mecca. Nobody was able to oust him from his position. The Holy Prophet removed Abu Sufyan from that position and he entered Mecca. And I tell you, when him and his companions entered Mecca, some of them had old friends of theirs or old relatives who were on the side of the Quraysh. Therefore, in some cases, it was difficult for them to remove these people because in some cases they were their relative. Let me give you an example. Ali ibn Abi Talib had two sisters. He had Jumana and Fakhita. He had three brothers, Ja'far, Aqil, and Talib. Two sisters, Jumana and Fakhita. Fakhita, the sister of Ali ibn Abi Talib, lived with one of the main members of the Quraysh. She lived with him and this person was one of the opposition to Rasulullah's message. Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib, when he entered Mecca to bring victory in Mecca, Imam entered and he knew he'd have to go to the house of his sister. So he entered the house of his sister wearing a mask. When he entered the house of his sister, he said to her, listen, get out of this house. This area has now been conquered by Rasulullah. You are not allowed to defend your husband. Of course, she doesn't recognize who he is because he's wearing a mask. So she looked at him and she said, get out of my house. Do you know who my brother is? If my brother found out that you came to mess with me in my house, you will not live for another day. Her husband even looked at him and he said, listen, her brother is a ferocious warrior. Do not even try and mess with us in this house. Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib looked at the both of them and he said, listen, stop with this talk. Both of you now, Rasulullah has conquered this area. Both of you show respect, please. She said to him again, I warn you, my brother. He removed the mask. He said, do you recognize me now? Remove yourself from the house. You found that some of them had to enter the houses of their old relatives because Mecca had now been conquered and Abu Sufyan's henchmen were there. But of course, Rasulullah, when he conquered Mecca, offered them, he said to them, listen, you want to join the religion of Islam? Join. We're not going to compel any of you. And if you're not going to join the religion, at least don't fight the religion. Yes, if you're not going to join, don't fight. And you had on that day, those who were freed by Rasulullah came under an important heading in Islamic political theory. Those of you who've studied political science at university or those of you who are about to study, I would be delighted if one day one of you wrote a paper, either a master's or a PhD, on the theory of the tulaqa within Islamic political science. The tulaqa, you know, talaq means when you separate, correct? The tulaqa are those who were freed or separated on the day of the opening of Mecca. What does that mean? That means they joined the religion of Islam. They would never, not necessarily join the religion wholeheartedly. But Rasulullah, when they came to him, they said to him, listen, forgive us for what we've done. People like Abu Sufyan and his likes. Rasulullah looked at them and he said, you are the tulaqa, you are freed on this day. The tulaqa were freed on that day. Why is it important? Because in the theories of Ahl Sunnah, the tulaqa cannot become khulafa. Please understand this point. If you are freed on the day of Mecca, you can't become a Khalifa. Why? Because we don't know if you join the religion of Islam wholeheartedly 
or you join the religion out of the status quo as in you've seen in the Quran there's some verses which talk of a group of people called al muallafati qulubuhum correct innama as-sadaqatu lil-fuqara wal masakin wal 'amalin 'alayha wal muallafati qulubuhum al muallafati qulubuhum sometimes the translation is written those whose hearts are reconciled many times people ask me sayyidna those whose hearts are reconciled who are they these are a group of people who joined Islam on the day of the opening of Mecca. Their hearts weren't necessarily in the religion, but they thought the status quo for us to survive is to join the religion. Those people can't become Khulafa. That's why Sayyidah Zainab attacked Yazid in Sham. She said to him, Ya ayabna tulaqa, O son of those who were freed. Meaning what? Meaning your father should never become Khalifa because your father was of the tulaqa of the opening of Mecca. The tulaqa cannot become Khulafa because there is no certainty about their Iman. They are not like those who served the religion of Islam for many years. Therefore the tulaqa joined the religion. There were others who who submitted so you found Rasulullah had conquered Mecca and he had conquered Medina however there were two tribes living outside Mecca who said Muhammad if he wants to let him come to us face to face and if he wants our submission he's not getting it because we are Thaqif and we are Hawazin you see in the area towards Ta'if and these areas you had two famous tribes Thaqif and Hawazin Thaqif and Hawazin used to produce ferocious warriors anyone called a Thaqafi is from Thaqif and I'm sure your minds have gone to one man straight away correct or no where did all your minds go straight away Mukhtar, but even before you've gone to Mukhtar, you should have come back. Ali al Akbar from his mom's side is a Thaqafi. Because Ali al Akbar's mother Layla, her grandparents from both sides, from one side, her great grandfather is Abu Sufyan, from the other side, her great grandfather is Urwa bin Mas'ud al Thaqafi. Ali al Akbar from his mom's side is a Thaqafi, Mukhtar is a Thaqafi. Then you also have sometimes bad apples come out from families, yes? So also you had Hajjaj bin Yusuf al Thaqafi. Likewise, you had, for example, Mughira bin Shu'bal Thaqafi. So, in other words, the Thaqafis and the Hawazis were ferocious warriors. The Thaqafis turned around and said, Listen, Muhammad may have won Mecca because, in their own words, there are many effeminate men in Mecca. I don't want to go too much into the poetry because it's not appropriate for the member. So, there's too many effeminate men in Mecca. We, the real Arabs of Thaqif and Hawazin, are the Arabs of the mountains. Nobody messes with us. We are led by Uthman bin Abdullah and Malik bin Awf and Nasri. And to our head is Abu Jardal. These three were the most ferocious warriors in the mountains in Arabia. You know, sometimes you hear anecdotes of those who used to wrestle with lions for fun. And you're thinking, me in a zoo, I'm scared to even go near the lion in the cage. These three used to enjoy looking for the wild animals of the deserts just to see if they could test themselves out on them. So these three sent a message to the Prophet Muhammad saying that we're going to come and attack you. And we really don't care how big your number is. Because while we have Uthman bin Abdullah, Malik bin Auf, and Abu Jardal, there's only one person in your army who worries us. Other than that, your army is an army full of weak individuals. Rasulullah, when he heard these people, you see, these people didn't have to be Muslim, but they wanted to attack Islam. A person cannot be compelled to be a Muslim. Uh, if you're a Christian or you're Jewish, like the Christians of Mubahala, you, can't, con uh, con uh, you have to, can't coerce them to become Muslims. These people weren't being coerced, but they wanted to attack the religion. So they wrote to the Prophet saying to him, whether you like it or you don't, we're going to meet you. And this is where we're going to meet you, and there's going to be a war. Rasulullah, when he received this letter, he turned around to his companions. He said to them very well, my companions, we have been written a letter saying that we are to be fought. Are you all ready to join me? They said to him, Ya Rasulullah, 10,000 of us from Medina, 2,000 of us from Mecca, all of us are ready to join. Of course, the likes of Abu Sufyan, all of them even joined because you can't look like the odd one out. You all have to go towards the jihad. Yet when Rasulullah was about to leave Mecca, a question arises in Islamic political theory. Did Rasulullah leave Mecca and put a leader or did he leave Mecca and leave it leaderless?
Why? Rasulullah, people ask the question that if he left Mecca for Hunayn and left Alida, then there's no way he'll leave the Ummah without Alida. Correct? Because if I'm leaving Mecca for a short time, I'm definitely going to appoint Alida, aren't I? I'm going to make sure there's someone to look after the affairs of my Ummah. If Rasulullah didn't leave a leader, then I will say to you that Rasulullah is the type he wants people to choose their leaders, correct? Rasulullah, when he's about to leave Mecca, would no way leave Mecca leaderless. Why? If he leaves Mecca leaderless, then what's going to happen? I'm going to choose my best friend, aren't I? I'm not going to choose the person who's appropriate. When you leave Mecca leaderless, you're going to choose your best friend. So Rasulullah made sure that he left the Ummah with a leader. And the famous poet says, if he left Mecca for a few days and he appointed a leader, so how dare those say that at Saqifa there was no leader? What happened was he left a leader. Who did he leave? He left Itab bin Usaid. Itab bin Usaid was how old at the time? Itab bin Usaid was 20. And the irony of ironies, you leave behind a 20 year old and that's good enough to leave and lead Mecca. But a 33 year old is not good enough to lead the Ummah. Yes. Those who came and said later that Ali ibn Abi Talib is too young to lead. Itab bin Usaid was 20 when he led. How comes Rasulullah let a 20 year old lead Mecca? If 20 is not uh, old, then Ali ibn Abi Talib at 33, what do you describe that as? He left Itab bin Usaid. He left him in Mecca. Then he told his soldiers, let's go towards Hunayn. When he left with his soldiers, you know how many soldiers he left with? 12,000. How many? 12,000. Do you know the opposition at Hunayn? Do you know how many soldiers they had? 4,000. Yes? 4,000 against 12,000. The ayah of the Quran is so blunt. Surah 9 verse 25. لَقَدْ نَصَرَكُمُ اللَّهُ فِي مَوَاطِنَ كَثِيرَةٍ وَيَوْمَ حُنَيْنٍ إِذْ أَعْجَبَتْكُمْ كَثْرَتُكُمْ Allah gave you victory in many places. And on the day of Hunayn, when your numbers made you proud, you see when 12,000 go out and there's 4,000 across, many of these 12,000 turn around and say, this is going to be an easy victory today. And so we've got nothing to worry about. There's 4,000 of them. There's 12,000 of us. We'll annihilate them. They will no way come near us. Rasulullah turned around and said, Don't be arrogant. Don't be arrogant. Why? Because you will notice that there was a day at Badr we were this many and they were a great number. And yet Allah did not look at the quantity. He looked at the quality of the soldiers on the day. Likewise, on this day, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not going to look at your arrogance. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to look for you to be humble when you face this opposition. We're not going to war so that we arrogantly treat the opposition. If it was our chance, we want to bring them towards the religion of Islam. But they're adamant that they want to fight us. You see, a man with dignity doesn't want to see his opposition killed. He wants to see them come towards the path. I'll never forget Imam al Hussein on the 10th of Muharram when he said, I cry for you that because of me, you will go to hellfire. Likewise, Rasulullah was the same. Rasulullah told his soldiers, don't be arrogant. And subhanallah, his soldiers, you would think would listen to him. Unfortunately, those at the front didn't listen to him on that day. You know what happened? At the front, 12,000 of them against 4,000. And you know the soldiers of Thaqif and Hawazin, you know what they said at the beginning of the battle? Three of them came out and they said, Oh, soldiers of Muhammad, we are 4,000 and you are 12. Yet we don't fear you. We actually are certain we will defeat you. There's only one man in your army who we want to face. For for many years, we have heard the stories of him on the battlefield. And if truly he is what people describe him to be, then let him come out and face us one on one today. Who was it? Amir al-Mu'mineen. As an Amir al-Mu'mineen was on the side of Rasulullah, Amalik bin Awf, Uthman bin Abdullah came out, Abu Jardal, they said, Ali ibn Abi Talib is all you have to worry about on their side. The rest of them are a joke. Few minutes and they'll be finished. And even if you're lucky, most of them will not even stay. But Ali ibn Abi Talib will face him one on one and that will be enough. And you know, Malik bin Awf and Uthman bin Abdullah had decided they will do a double combo against Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib. You know double combo when two against one? Yes. They had decided it will be a double combo against Amir al-Mu'mineen. Khalid ibn al-Walid witnessing this, Khalid ibn al-Walid thought, you know what, these are 4,000, we're 12. I'm going to go in from the morning and I'm going to annihilate them myself. Yes, 
Because sometimes this happens between soldiers. One wants the praise ahead of the other. So he decided, I'll go in the morning. You see, with people who live in the mountains, don't mess about with them when it comes to tactics, correct? I'm sure many of you know of a couple of examples, closely related to home, in fact, of a couple of examples of people who live in the mountains. You think that you're going to finish a war quickly? No, not at all. It could take years when you enter the mountains. Why? Because they know the passes you don't. You know what happened? He went in the morning and he thought, you know what? I'm going to finish them. He tried to go through the narrow passes and the Quran mentions it clearly. Suddenly the earth became so tight when it seemed so big before, correct? The earth became so tight when it seemed so big before. Khalid ibn al-Walid thought, you know what, I'm going to annihilate the opposition. But he didn't realize those at the foot of the mountains were waiting for him. All of a sudden, jumping from different ends of the mountain, Malik bin Awf, Uthman bin Abdullah, Abu Jardal emerged one by one. 12,000 soldiers, yes? 12,000. Do you know by the end how many were left from those who ran away? Eight. You think Uhud was something? It's not something to smile about. This is academic analysis. It's not humorous majlis. Maybe people who are sitting in the crowd from other schools in Islam, this is not an aim to disrespect anyone. 12,000 again were fighting. 11,992 ran. Yes? The Quran mentions it clearly. Your numbers made you proud. Yes, they made you proud. All of you ran and ran and ran away. Yes, at Uhud, Quran said, in Qalabtum, Al Aqabikum. At Uhud, you ran away. At Hunain, it's not in Qalabtum. No, at Hunain, Walaytum. You ran and ran. Do you know these soldiers who were meant to be the most powerful soldiers ran like something had hit them like they've never seen? And Khalid ibn Walid, until today, when you go to many a community, they'll say to you, Khalid ibn Walid, Sayf Allah al Maslul. Correct? Wherever you go, Khalid ibn Walid, the sword of Allah. Khalid ibn al Walid, as the poet says clearly, on the day of Mu'ta, you were nowhere to be seen. And on the day of Hunayn, you ran faster than anyone around you. At least on those days, you were on the battlefield, not raping women after you killed their husbands. Anyway, so what happened was Khalid ibn Walid had run away and the rest of them had run away as well. You found Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib. How many were left? Eight, correct? At the front of them, Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib. Now listen to this. Eight versus 4,000. This is a moment which if I showed you it in a film, all of you would be like, wow, you know, that brave heart soldier, that gladiator, that last samurai. You will all look and say, what a ferocious warrior. Wallah, those are all myths. Ali ibn Abi Talib is a reality. Eight against 4,000, correct? Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib, number one. Next to him, his uncle, Abbas bin Abdul Muttalib, number two. Next to him, Al-Fadl ibn Al-Abbas, number three. Next to him, Rabi'ah ibn who? Ibn Al-Harith bin Abdul Muttalib. Next to him, Abu Sufyan ibn Al-Harith ibn Abdul Muttalib, the cousin of Rasulullah. Next to him, Ayman bin Ubaid. Next to him, who? Abdullah bin Mas'ud. Next to him, who? Osama bin Zayd. Osama, the 18-year-old, a few years later, correct? On the day of Hunayn, he was 15. Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib was at the front of all of them. Do you know what Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib said to all of them? He said, don't worry about those who ran away. If all of you stay with me, watch what I'm going to do now on the day of Hunayn to this opposition that faces me. When your leader says something like that, do you have to fear anything or no? Nothing. Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib looked towards the 4,000. Imagine eight against 4,000. And Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib just looks at the seven and he looks at Osama. Osama was only 15. And he looks at them and he says, don't worry, this is my day. And you know how one historian narrates this? There's one English historian who talks of the day of Hunayn. They say Ali ibn Abi Talib on the day of Hunayn was like a demon possessed. 
Yes? It's as if he said, you know what? This is my day. There is no one who's going to defeat me today. The rest of the world run. There were even shouts from people like Abu Sufyan and the Umayyads who pretended they came to Islam. There were shouts from some of them. Do you know what they were shouting? The magic of Muhammad has ended. Yes, they thought, surely this is the end now. There were others who were saying, Muhammad's soldiers are running to the sea. And Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib was at the front of all of these seven soldiers who were alongside him. Who came forward? Abu Jardal and Uthman bin Abdullah. It was the day they were waiting for. Them two against Ali ibn Abi Talib. In a few moments, those two never existed again in the annals of history. Yes? You know what he did with the two of them? They both came. And these were archers and swordsmen of the highest repute. But you see with Dhul Fiqar, what Dhul Fiqar can do is it can snap one sword where he can pull both of them and finish you. Correct? The books of history mention that two of them against one and they're attacking from both sides and he's fighting and they're attacking and he's fighting. And then all of a sudden with one blow, both of their necks were on the ground. He then looked towards the rest of the soldiers of the rest of the soldiers. He managed to annihilate many of them who were in front of him. Khaybar, he managed to annihilate a number. Uhud a number. Khandaq one. Hunayn, it went into the hundreds. One after the other, he let go of them. And they were then in a position where they ran away. Rasulullah sees his companions running on one side and he's calling out, O oh, companions of Badr, O oh, companions who pledged on the day of the Ravwan under the tree, where are you going? And he sees Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib on the other bringing victory. And subhanallah, what a performance on that day. Unequaled by any soldier in Islamic history, the way 4,000 against 8, he managed to annihilate them. And he came back to Rasulullah with all humility saying, Ya Rasulullah, this was for you and for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When they collected all the spoils of the war, you would think all the spoils should go to Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib, correct or no? As in, for there's eight against 4,000, Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib annihilates them. You would think the spoils should go to the one who fights. Suddenly, all of these Sahaba start fighting. We want the spoils. We want the spoils. Habibi, you, the Quran said, you ran away. It's like someone saying that, you know what? We build a whole building. He puts all of his time in. And the one who wasn't even in the building comes on the day of the building and says, I want the perks of this business as well. Where were you in building this building? Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib on that day, he's the one who bought victory. Yet these Sahaba would come to Rasulullah and when they would come, they'd say, Muhammad, where's our share of the spoils of Hunayn? And you know what extent they reach some of these? Subhanallah. You know in Islamic economics, when you give out the spoils of war, it falls under two categories. Either it falls under the category of khums or it falls under the category of fay. Khums is if you've won victory through war, you distribute it as khums, correct? If you haven't won victory through fighting, you distribute it as fay. Fedek for Fatima al Zahra is distributed as Fay because there was no fighting with the Jews of Fedek. Whereas in this battle, the battle of Hunayn, whatever you gained, you have to distribute as Khums. So these companions would come to Rasulullah. Muhammad, we want our Khums. The first of the spoils which Rasulullah gave of the, of the spoils of the battle of Hunayn, the first of them he gave was to whom? He gave to the group Mu'allafati Qulubu. Yes? The Mu'allafat Qulubu and those whose hearts are reconciled, he gave them more of the spoils than the other Sahaba. Why? Someone asked the question. Why? Mu'allafat Qulubu, you give them more than the others because of four reasons. Either because they came towards the aid of the religion of Islam and they've only just joined the religion, so you should give them more of the spoils than the rest. Or because they're thinking about joining Islam and maybe by giving them some of the spoils you're showing them that you're as much part of this religion as everybody else. Or because their tribe, some of them may join the religion when they see the fairness of, recon of giving the spoils. Or the fourth reason, because giving them more than the rest may stop their evil, not bring their good. What do I mean? When Abu Sufyan, you give him more than the rest. Not because Abu Sufyan cares about Islam. No. Maybe I give Abu Sufyan more than the rest so that Abu Sufyan's evil will be less than what his good is offer. Maybe that me giving him more, Abu Sufyan's evil towards the religion will be diluted. 
So he therefore gave Al-Mu'allafati Quloobuhum, those whose hearts reconciled, he gave them more than the rest. So some of these companions came and complained. One of them who came, may Allah's la'na go on this person. This person by the name of Hurqus bin Zuhair al-Tamimi. Hurqus bin Zuhair al-Tamimi later fought Ali ibn Abi Talib at Nahrawan. Because you know what Hunayn did? Hunayn brought about a lot of hatred in the hearts of people. Ali ibn Abi Talib's victory on that day made a lot of people envious. A lot didn't forget that. Yes, a lot of them later on would remember this man killed our dads, killed our uncles. Hurqus bin Zuhair al-Tamimi comes to Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib, comes to Rasulullah. Do you know what he does to Rasulullah? Pulls his beard. I, I would never dare to even touch my father. This man is meant to be a companion, correct? He pulls the beard of Rasulullah. How dare you give others more than you give us? Habibi Harqus, you didn't even give anything to the battle. Ali ibn Abi Talib is the one who gave you. Eight against 4,000, Ali ibn Abi Talib is the one at the front. He comes to Rasulullah and says, how dare you give more? And others try to stop him. Rasulullah said, no, remain calm. This man from him, there'll be a day of the black banners. Yes, the day of Nahrawan, those who come fight. Be patient with this man. Do not worry about him. Then there were others. They saw Rasulullah give Al Agra and give Abis amongst others some of the stipend. And they felt these people received more than them. So they'd come to Rasulullah and say, How dare you, Muhammad? We are the people who have fought. And you give these who have just joined the religion. And Rasulullah turned around with a famous line. And if you want to research this line, Sahih al Bukhari, there's a chapter called the chapter of Al Mu'allafati Qulubuhum. In that chapter, Rasulullah, do you know what he says when they attacked him in this way? He turned around and he said, You know what? May Allah give patience. May Allah bless Nabi Musa. He had a more difficult time with his companions than even this. Subhanallah. That's Rasulullah. Even though he's being abused, he remembers Nabi Musa and says, Nabi Musa had even more difficulty than this. Yes, you would find that I'm under pressure, but Nabi Musa even was under pressure. The point was what? Rasulullah is giving out the spoils. These people, instead of thanking Ali ibn Abi Talib, instead of coming and saying, Ali, you have done well for us. No, 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 no. Where's the swords? Where's the shields? Where's the armor? These are the people I trust with the religion of Islam. Um, this nonsense, these people, half of them running away from battles, the other half all caring about the spoils. Subhanallah, these are the people Rasulullah had to deal with. Yet he remained patient with them. He said to them, remain patient with me. These spoils will be shared out. And he made sure that he shared out the spoils equally to everyone who was around him. Therefore, this battle was what? This battle was a decisive victory for Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib and for Rasulullah. That Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib had a stand on that day that was meritorious. That would never be forgotten. What it did create without a doubt, out is a hatred in many of the Muslims who were to come after that battle. Why? There were many who were sons of those at Hunayn. Yes, they would wait for a day when they would meet Ali ibn Abi Talib's son. Yes, because there is a line of poetry which mentions Ahqad Badriya wa Hunayniya. There are some who had haqid, hatred from that day because how dare he kill our dads? We'll one day take it out on his son. And that they did on the 10th of Muharram. Question arises, this verse, verse 25 of chapter 9, did the Imams of Ahlul Bayt ever refer to it? Yes, they did. Did they refer to it in which context? Let's look at the context. The first Imam to refer to this verse Verse was Imam Al Hadi, Salawatullah wa Salamuhu alayhi. Imam Al Hadi alayhi salam, one day Mutawakkil fell ill. When Mutawakkil fell ill, the famous Khalifa of Bani Abbas, when he fell ill, the narrations mentioned that he done a nether, you know, he made a vow. Yes, nether, he made a vow. He said, Ya Allah, if I recover, I will give away mal kathir. O oh, Amwal Kathira. Yes, sometimes these Khulafa do have their days. So he said that. He said, Ya Allah, I will give away a great amount. So he made that nether that, Ya Allah, if I recover, I will give this away. He recovered. Then he sat with his companions who were around him. He said to them, My dear companions, I have recovered. And I made a nether to Allah. I made a vow that I will give away Mal Kathir. O oh, Amwal Kathira. But I don't know what I meant. Because mal kathir could mean anything. If I now make a vow, 
that I'm going to give away, for example, a certain amount. It could be a hundred dinar, it could be a thousand dinar, it could be ten thousand. So he turned to his companions, he said to them, when I said mal kathir, what could be the meaning of mal kathir? Go and bring me some of the jurists. So they brought one jurist. What's the meaning of mal kathir? One jurist said, uh, give away a hundred dinar. He said, I'm not convinced. They asked another jurist, what's the meaning of mal kathir? He said, a thousand dinar. They asked another jurist, he said, ten thousand. He said, you know what, you guys are giving me all confusing answers. I don't like confusing answers. Someone's going to be beheaded any second. Stop giving me confusing answers. So all of them said, we're sorry. He said, if anyone could give me the right answer, I'll reward him ten thousand dinar. Someone called Hassan, put his hand up. He said, oh Khalifa, he said, yes. He said, I know where to get the answer for mal kathir. He said, what do you mean you know? He said, I know someone who as soon as you tell him you've made a vow for Mal Kathir, he'll tell us exactly what Mal Kathir means in Islam. He said to him, listen, young man, if you bring me the answer and it's correct, I will give you 10,000 dinar. And if you bring me a wrong answer, I'll behead you. This is the Khulafa Islam was blessed with, Alhamdulillah. So then what happened was, Hassan went to Imam Al-Hadi. When he came to the 10th Imam, he said to him, Oh, Imam, Mutawakkil made the nither. He said, Yes, what's the nither? He said, He made the nither. If he recovers from his illness, he'll give away Amwal Kathira or Mal Kathir. How much is that? Imam Al-Hadi said, 80 dinar. He said, Sorry? He said, 80. He said, Imam, all I did was ask you straight away. You said, 80. He said, Yes, 80. He said, How did you determine that? He said, Surah 9, verse 25. He said, what do you mean? He said, Allah in Surah 9 verse 25 said, لَقَدْ نَصَرَكُمُ اللَّهُ فِي مَوَاطِنَ كَثِيرَةٍ وَيَوْمَ حُنَيْنِ Allah gave you victories فِي مَوَاطِنْ كَثِيرَةٍ وَيَوْمَ حُنَيْنِ So he said, well, how did you reach 80? He said, Allah told the Prophet, I gave you victories in a number of great places and on the day of Hunayn. He said, okay, how did you reach 80? He said, because Allah gave Rasul Allah 80 victories in war. Either victories under his command or victories on Saraya, which his companions were sent on. The total number is 80. Therefore, Mutawakkil has to pay 80 dinar. This person went back to Mutawakkil. He said to him, 80. He said, how did you know 80? He said, the ayah in the Quran. He said, yes, I use the word Kathira as well. He said to him, so how much is it? He said, 80. He said, how do you know? He said, the great grandson of Rasul Allah told me. He said, what did he tell you? He said, Rasul Allah, Allah said to him, I've given you Kathira victories. Great number. In Arabic, Kathir means a great number. So when we asked him how many, he said, Allah gave Rasul Allah a total of 80. That means Mutawakkil has to pay 80. Therefore, the first time it was used was where? The first time Hunayn was used was with Mutawakkil Abba. The other time Hunayn was used directly was with Imam Zain al Abidin in the court of Yazid in Sham. How? This is an important point. Yazid sees Sukaina and Ruqayya with chains next to them, yes? And he sees Zainab and Kumthum with chains around them as well. He was sitting with some of his ambassadors and he looked at all of Sayyidah Zainab, he looked at Kulthum, he looked at Rabab, he looked at Layla. He started to mock them one by one. And he started to play with the holy lips of Imam al Hussein, yes? Imam al Hussein's head was next to him. He started to poke the lips of Imam al Hussein. Then he started to poke the eyes of Imam al Hussein. Yes, the head was right next to him. Then he looked around and he said the famous lines of poetry. These lines are vital. Do you know why? Because he was highlighting, I haven't forgotten the battles of your grandfather Muhammad. Yes, when I play with his lips today, it's so that I got revenge for those battles. Yes, so he said later as Shiaqi Bibadrin Shahidu Jaza al Khazajim and Wak al Asal La Hello was the Hello Faraha from Makalu Yazid Latushal Laibat Hashim Bil Mulk Fala Hawarun Jah Wala Wahun Nazal. Listen to how he mocked Sayyidah Zainab alayhi salam and how he mocked Imam Zain Abedin. He said, I wish my ancestors from Badr were present. Yes, so they're able to witness all of this. Hashim played with the kingdom there was no revelation and there was no revealing he said that what was he trying to do he was trying to say Badr's revenge is today 
Yes? That my ancestors at Badr, you know his great-grandfather, Utbah, the father of Hind, his, his grandmother, was killed by Ali ibn Abi Talib at Badr. Yes? So what he was saying was, Later ashyakhi bi Badrin, I wish my ancestors at Badr were in Sham today, so that they see what I've done to Ali ibn Abi Talib. Son, I have not forgotten Badr. You know how Imam Zain al-Abideen replied to him? Imam Zain al-Abideen replied with a reply to tell him, you know what? I haven't forgotten Badr as well, but also I haven't forgotten Hunayn as well. How? Imam Zain al-Abideen looked in front of Yazid. He was all chained up. He looked at him and he said, Oh Yazid, Allah has given us six and favored us in seven. Allah has given us generosity and patience and eloquence and bravery and knowledge and the believer's love for us. And Allah has given us excellence in that from us is the Holy Prophet. From us is Fatima al-Zahra. From us is Hamza. From us is Ja'far al-Tayyar. From us is Hassan. From us is Hussein. And from us us is the awaited savior yes then Imam Zain Abdin said to him those oh, those of you who know me he's looking at the whole court those of you who know me know me those of you who don't let me tell you who I am I am the son of Mecca and Mina I am the son of Zamzam and Safa I am the son of the man who held the black robe and circumambulated the Kaaba I am the son of the man who was taken by Barak through the air I am the son of the man who led the angels in prayer I am the son of the man who was taken to Sidrat al Muntaha. I am the son of Muhammad al Mustafa. I am the son of Ali al Murtaba, the man who fought the disbelievers until they said, La ilaha illallah. Then he said, I am the man, uh, son of the man who fought with two swords and pledged two allegiances and fought with two spears. Listen, Hajar Hijratain, Baya Bayatain. قاتل أنا ابن من قاتل و ببدر وحنين. I'm the son of the man who fought at Badr and Hunain. Oh Yazid, do you think by mocking us about Badr it's over? While I'm alive, my grandfather, what he did at Badr and Hunain will always remain alive. You think you're gonna mock what happened at Badr? Wallah, we are the grandsons of the man who brought victory at Badr. In that khutbah, Imam didn't say, أنا ابن من قاتل ببدر وخندق أنا ابن من قاتل ببدر وخيبر أنا ابن من قاتل ببدر وحنين I'm the son of the man who fought at Badr and Hunayn. Just in case you forgot, the Arabs of Thaqif were annihilated by my grandfather. You know what? We're not dead. We are all alive. While me and Zainab are here, Ali ibn Abi Talib never dies. And while Imam al Hussein is here, Imam Rasul Allah never dies. And then Yazid was shaken by that line. I am the son of the man who fought at Badr and Hunayn. He was shaken. So what did he do? He said, recite Adhan. They recited Adhan. They called out, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. Imam Zain al abidin said, there is none greater than Allah. He then said, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah. Imam Zain al abidin said, my eyes and my lips and my flesh and my bone testify that there is no God but Allah. Then he said, Ashhadu anna Muhammadan Rasul Allah. Imam Zain al abidin said, oh Yazid, is Muhammad your grandfather or is he mine? If you say he is your grandfather, then you are alive. But if you say he is mine, then why did you massacre his son on the plains of Karbala? Correct? Imam Zain al Abidin for many years would not forget that day, the day of the 10th of Muharram. If he walked past an area where a sheep is about to be killed, he would come to the butcher. He'd say to him, Oh butcher, did you give water to the sheep before you killed it? And the butcher would reply, Of course, O oh grandson of Rasul Allah, every creation of Allah deserves water water before it is killed he said to him my grandfather was killed thirsty on the 10th of Muharram on another occasion he walked past the graveyard he saw the man who buries the graves he said to him oh man will you bury me when I die he said of course I'll bury your grandson of Rasul Allah he said to him my father died and for three nights no one buried his holy body and that's why even on his deathbed 34 years after Karbala 
yes? On his deathbed, 34 years after Karbala, the narrations, what do they mention? The narrations mention that Imam al-Baqir says, my father Zain al-Abideen, the poison had surrounded his body. It was his final days. How hard it is for any of us when we see our father in his final moments. Those of you here, if you can remember your father in his final moments, when you heard the news that your father had passed away, how difficult was it for you? Or when you saw his eyes closed for the final time, how difficult was it for you? But alhamdulillah for all of us, we were able to help our father when he died, correct? We never faced a moment where we couldn't because we were ill, stand up to defend him. Imam al-Baqir narrates, he says, my father uh, Zain al-Abideen, the poison had surrounded his body. He was lying on the ground. So when I saw him in such pain, I came and embraced my father. He said, I embraced my father on his chest. Yes, that's where you would embrace your father when he dies, on his chest. He said, I embraced my father on his chest. He said, as soon as I embraced my father on his chest, he began to cry in a way I have never ever seen him cry. I looked towards him. I said to him, my father, why do you cry? When in a moment you'll see Rasulullah, and in a moment you'll see Fatima al-Zahra. In a moment you'll see Ali ibn Abi Talib, and in a moment you'll see Imam al-Hassan. Oh my father, why do you cry? When in a moment you'll see your father, Imam al-Hussein. My father, why do you cry? The reply is a reply that hurts every lover. Imam al-Baqir said to him, my father, why do you cry? Imam Zain al Abidin looked at him and he said to him, my son Muhammad, 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 I cry because when I am dying, you are on my chest. Whereas do you know who sat on the chest of my father, Abba Abdullah, when he lay on the ground? I had to see Shimon sitting on the chest of my father and I wasn't able to come and help him when he lay on the ground. <laughs> we pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to raise us with Muhammad and Al Muhammad. Ya Allah, raise us with the Imam of our time, Imam Sahib al Asri wa Zaman. Allow us to be amongst his companions and those who follow his message. Unite the Ummah on the love of Muhammad and Al Muhammad. Allow us to honor the day of Hunayn and allow us to be amongst those who honor the merits of Amir al Mu'mineen. We pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the Surah al Fatiha, but before it, the loudest of your salawat.